All right, everybody. Today on the show, we have Dan Meese, also known as Skier Dan. Uh, Dan's been in the ski industry for 35 years and is the founder of Ski Creative, so we had plenty of stuff to talk about. Uh, we answered some of your questions at the end, so be sure to follow us on Instagram at 2 Pod to get on that next time. And yeah, other than that, hope you enjoy the show. Yeah, so let's get into it. I, I always start off with the an easy but loaded question. Who are you and what do you do? Uh, so my name's uh, Dan Meese, uh, a.k.a. Skier Dan. <laughs> and uh, what I do, my... Uh, Gosh, you know, my daytime job is I, I help tourists not get lost in our town of Leavenworth, Washington. That's where I live at. Uh, originally from uh, uh, the Glenwood Springs area in Colorado. That's where I grew up. And, uh, you know, just kind of uh, work with Ski Creative as my, uh, my passion and hobby to stay connected with uh, the ski industry and, you know, just uh, kind of promote just something different with skiing that's a little bit more on the weird creative side. <laughs> yeah. And so let's go way back. Let's uh, let's talk about where the start of your journey is. So growing up in Glenwood, you're probably surrounded by skiing your whole life. I I was, man. I uh, I was fortunate enough that my parents put me on skis when I was two years old. So uh, <laughs> coming up this May, it'll be uh, officially 35 years on skis. <laughs> <laughs> A long time. But uh, yeah, grew up in that area. So I was just about uh, 30 miles down valley from uh, Aspen. And so uh, being in that area, I was uh, surrounded, at least skiing up there in the Snowmass Aspen area, uh, watching Steel Spence, uh, Peter Olenek, and uh, Travis Reed. And uh, yeah, you know, just some old, old time legends uh, I grew up around. I was, uh, I was there for the first X Games uh, up there at Buttermilk, right when they got it started, uh, when they were like literally I think it was like the, one of the first ones that like Tanner got his first gold medal in uh, with a, what was it? I think a switch road set. And uh, there was like only like maybe 25 of us at the bottom of like, that's just how small it was with X games back then that you could be right up there on the, by the fence to actually like give those guys a high five. But yeah, no, I, I was there. Like I remember watching the first couple X games right when they came from Crested Butte and then moved over to, into the Aspen area. Nice. And so how old were you at that time? Gosh, at that time, um, gosh, it would have been around like uh, the year 2000. So I think it was around like nine, uh, 18 or 19 years old, I believe. Cool. So you and all your friends, were you guys all, were you guys all park kids? We were all park kids at that time. I mean, of course we still liked uh, riding all around the mountain, but you know, what the uh, the twin tip ski kind of coming out, you know, like a couple of years prior to that, you know, all of us were, I think still kind of rocking like the Solomon 10 eighties at that time still. And like the progression of uh, learning how to do uh, cork uh, spins on skis was like fresh out. So we're all trying to figure out how to do a cork seven. I remember at that time. Yeah. No, it was, uh, it, it's crazy. Uh, kind of looking back at that whole transition of, um, when the twin tip ski came out, I, I remember the first time I saw that uh, some guy going down on the Solomon 1080s and we're just like, holy cow, that thing has tips on both sides. And we saw him just do like a 180, like off a of mogul and still land switch in the mogul field and be able to ski out of it. And then from there, we're just like, oh man, there's now we can do everything on skis. Now that's just like a twin tip. It, it's kind of crazy to think about now because about every ski's twin tip. But at one point, I remember we were learning 540s on like, <laughs> you know, just regular skis. You'd land switch and then like hope for the best for the next 10 feet <laughs> and then have to revert around pretty quickly. <laughs> so it, it's pretty cool to see uh, just even that transition with ski when that Solomon 1080 ski came out. Yeah. And you got a pretty unique perspective of it because you were seeing – you probably saw snowboarding come up before park skiing really came up. So what was your kind of view of snowboarding when you were, uh, when you were younger? Uh, you know, I actually snowboarded off and on for about five or six years through my teenage years. And it wasn't because I had like a really a love for snowboarding. It was how we could get in a train park. Uh, at that time, skiers weren't allowed in, in uh, train parks, at least in um, kind of the, the buttermilk area. I remember buttermilk, their train park, it, it was snowboarders only. They didn't see a reason why a skier needed to be in there. So that's why we ended up buying snowboards 
was so we could actually get inside a, a terrain park. <laughs> but, you know, uh, yeah, that's kind of like how I got into snowboarding a little bit, but also uh, quite a bit of my buddies still did it. And then we, you know, probably like a lot of other skiers back that time, we, um, we saw what they were doing on, on their snowboards and then wanted to kind of bring that style over to skiing as far as like maybe some of the grabs they were doing, but a lot of it was just the style they had was um, a really smooth style that um, I think even today skiers, uh, you know, we, we still go hand in hand with each other as far as just like looking at how they do a trick and being like, man, I love that style. Maybe we can bring it over to like what I do on skis and it benefits both parties. So I, you know, I've, I've, I've never had the clash with the skiers versus snowboarders deal. I think they all, they all, they both go hand in hand. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Like, what was it like in those earlier days um, when it was only snowboarders in the park? Would you ever try to go in as a skier? I, I we tried to, but I remember uh, most of the jibs were, uh, were wood, like there are logs and, and we just got eaten up, man. <laughs> yeah. Like having like skis and trying to hit a log sideways. Uh yeah, we, we made it in, but man, there's a lot of edge catching. <laughs> we got beat up trying to slide on logs until boxes and rails kind of came around. Yeah, did, and you never had any clashes with uh, snowboarders telling you guys get, to like get the hell out of there, basically? No, no, not not at least at that mountain. It, it all went pretty peaceful and good. Uh, I do remember, though, it, it's crazy to look at now, but uh, at that time, especially when we were – just getting into a lot of park skiing, seeing skiers ride without poles at that time, we actually looked down on it because we were just like, why the heck would you ski without poles? And I remember like we would, you know, definitely would almost kind of give like a couple of the kids crap that were skiing without poles. Little did we know that eventually someday we would, a lot of us would be skiing without them. And uh, just even seeing that transition of where a few were doing it without poles way before anybody knew about it and like we were kind of hating on it little did we know that like it was gonna you know really change the game eventually later on with a lot of us going without poles and uh you know probably to even get into this a, a little discussion about the pole game because i've been asked about it quite a bit um you know like when people are like well sh should you ski with poles or should you ski without them and uh I, I've always said like a little bit of both is good. Um, you know, coming from what I saw with uh, Tom Wallace back in the day when he first came out and it was like in the earliest four by nine videos, I would always be seeing him rocking without poles and it, his upper body would just be dialed because when you would go without poles, you notice your arms, your arm movement, upper body, like it's getting crazy. Uh, without poles, you can, you'll can you notice that. When you do have the poles in the hands, it can kind of camouflage a lot of flaws. So uh, kind of watching how Tom was doing it, going without poles for the longest time to create that after bang steez. And then like, he, from what I, I, I believe I heard, he was getting docked in uh, competitions because he wasn't using poles, so he started using them. But what was cool is that the muscle memory that he created by skiing without poles. Once you put poles in that dude's hands, his arms still stayed locked at the side. And so like I've always told people, I was like, man, you do a little bit of both. You can just, uh, they, they both play on each other. You can get a nice, uh, calm upper body. So when you do put poles in the hands, uh, yeah, they, they stay a little bit more calm and like, gosh, even when you go without poles, like I found out at least with, uh, park skiing, uh, it kind of makes you originate all your movements, uh, out of your ankles instead of your upper body. And so, uh, yeah, it keeps the upper body calm and you can, uh, yeah, you just stay a little bit more solid. And plus, I, I, at least for me, I, I, I just get better style without poles. <laughs> yeah. You, you put me on a big mountain line without poles, man. I look horrible. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's really cool that you've seen kind of the culture shift in that. I mean, then there's another whole cultural debate and, you know, it, it, it gets beaten to death, but was there ever a debate about the helmets versus no helmets? Because I know, like way back, you look at these old, that like really old footage. Nobody's wearing a helmet. Like they're all just wearing these little, little hats with the pom poms on it. So what have you seen with that, like throughout your time in skiing? Um, you know, I've I, I've I've asked had people ask me because I I don't ride with a helmet too often. Uh, 
you know, I have, you know, definitely if I'm doing some risky stuff, but it, it's kind of like to each its own, you know, like if, if you want to wear a helmet, that's totally cool. If, if not, that's cool too. Uh, personally for me and, you know, maybe a few others, we all like kind of chuckle at the fact that whenever we put on a helmet, we ended up getting ourselves jacked up because we, we put on that helmet. We're just like, all right, now I'm invincible. But that, that was only maybe if you hit your head. So we never would hit our head. We would break off our knees or something else. And so I know for me, um, I kind of sometimes not wearing a helmet kind of puts me in check not to get too crazy. But uh, I, I still kind of look at the fact of it, it you know, if, if you do want to wear a helmet, that that's totally cool. It's just, I, I'm just a little bit old school on it. And I just found out I always get myself jacked up whenever I put on a helmet because for some reason then I feel like I'm invincible. <laughs> yeah, I kind of agree. You know, I, I wear a helmet like the majority of the time, like what you were saying, it, it makes me feel more confident, but I'm in, like, I don't care if people wear them, if people don't wear them, it's just kind of do whatever you want, you know? Yeah, no, I, I agree, man. And gosh, you know, the, the times I think I've worn the helmet the most is when it's like looking like it's going to be a rough weather day. And it's mostly to keep like my head dry. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, out here on the East Coast, every day is a rough weather day, basically. So we're never we're never blessed with any really soft snow. So it's always got to prepare for ice. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the thing is, though, with helmets, man, they, they do they do save lives. You know, I've, I've had some buddies that have definitely gotten some concussions. Uh, because they weren't wearing a helmet. It was just was smack in their head and that, that probably could have saved them. But, you know, I've also seen people get concussions by just kneeing themselves in the jaw and knocking themselves out that way. And a helmet was never going to save you. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's a good thing. It, it works for some. It might not work for, for others. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And so another thing that you've kind of, you've gotten to see the evolution of is like the video parts and the, and the ski movies. So who were kind of some of your early, uh, movie influences when you're growing up oh well definitely uh poor boys productions uh that that was uh my biggest influence uh as far as like really getting a glimpse into like what the ski world was becoming uh movies like uh 13 and propaganda and uh happy days like those were probably like my earliest movies i i'd watch them so much that that the actual tape inside the VHS would get so worn out. I remember I have to put scotch tape on it because I would watch propaganda so many times. And, uh, you know, at least growing up, I'd say uh, Vincent Dorian was probably uh, my earliest model. I always uh, looked up to with skiing, uh, along with uh, probably J.F. Cousin. And then as it progressed, uh, you know, through the, the movies that were coming out, the next biggest movie that probably really um, touched with me was the movie Idea by Eric Einberg. And then uh, that movie, I remember when it came out and I've talked to some buddies about this. Uh, it premiered, I remember, at Evo in Seattle and it was right before Tanner Hall's movie Show and Prove. And we all watched the watched it at the premiere and we we're just like wow this is a pretty sick movie but man it's just completely different like the soundtrack the vibe of it and everything and we didn't really think about it that much until we watched the movie a couple more times after the premiere and we're like wow this might might have been like one of the best ski movies ever made you know as far as it how it progressed the sport so much you know uh Pretty much like the three main guys in there. Who do we have? We had Eric Pollard, Pat Fujas, and uh, Andy Mayer. And they like the whole movie, man. They they didn't ski with poles at all, and they and they did a ton of just crazy stuff in uh, just the backcountry and pillow drops and everything else without poles. And uh, for me, uh, seeing that it it just opened up the door of like what you could do without poles, but also just the the style that they brought to it. And then uh, another one is just a soundtrack that they used for that ski film. Uh, same with like Hunting Yeti, uh, which came after that. It was just, it went against the grain of what other ski movies have always done, which was a lot of rap and hip hop. And, and they went like towards like Kali P, like kind of reggae, uh, all the way into like their second movie, which was a lot of super tramp, you know, like some classic rock. And 
it turned the movie more instead of it just being a ski flick it turned it into like a an art piece and i think even if you watched uh Eric Poehler's last movie uh, that he came out with like about a year ago, it's, it's the same thing when people got done watching it, they're just like, it, it's a piece of art versus it just being like a hyped up, you know, adrenaline rush ski movie. And there, there's something about that with those like kind of calmer flow movies uh, with a good soundtrack. It just comes off like a work of art. And I think those last sometimes longer than the ones that are just like balls to the wall, just hardcore movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And are there any other, you know, as time progressed, were there any other movies that made you think, damn, this is, this is changing the game? Because there's been so many different kind of eras of, of ski films. Um, yes, it's crazy, you know, like I, I know even Tanner said it, you know, like the, the, the ski game changes uh, with every movie or edit that drops. I, now with like social media, it, it changes daily. You know, um, it used to be like you'd wait once a year to see like how the industry was changing. Now it does it quite a bit. Uh, but at least back in the day when uh, it was ski movie premieres and we still had to order ski movies to figure out what was going on in the game. Um, probably one of my, gosh, the, the movie Refresh uh, by Level One where he teamed up with Warren Miller, uh, that, that was a game changer. I think that was like one of the coolest deals was to actually see how they actually brought Warren Miller out of the woodworks to have him kind of narrate on like a new school kind of ski film. So I remember that was a, a huge film. I know that definitely uh, meant a, a lot to me, like watching it all, all the time because I grew up uh, always watching Warren Miller films, but to watch him narrate a level one. And I just remember uh, Will Wesson's segment in there was just insane just seeing the jibbing that was coming out but it it's really hard to say which movie <laughs> was the pinnacle one that's like you know uh, kind of changed the industry i still think that the movie uh yeah idea was one and then uh you know i think everybody to this day it can gosh if i if i what was that poor boy's film like uh, tw it's the one that pet fuhas had like the the best segment ever was it 12 12 22 or something like that but you know um as far as lately uh what i've seen that's came out the most recent uh that has really changed the game you know, the new zoot space movie oh yeah uh, i don't know if you saw that but that that two-year project that those boys put together and i i saw what they were doing just on that urban side um I, I, I felt like that movie changed the game a lot um, as far as like a, a kind of an underground crew that it, they, they stayed pretty low key, but man, when they, when they dropped something, it, it was mind blowing actually to watch that. So I, I know this last year that that was probably one of my favorite movies to watch and be like, okay, you guys might've just changed the game a little bit with the urban scene. And that's actually, that actually, makes the whole idea of like game changing films more relatable for me because you know when i came into the ski scene step was already around level one's already been around so i came in with urban and came in with like all these insane movies but then i watch zoo space and i'm like oh my god this is this is groundbreaking this is something completely different and just so sick i had i must have watched it like like a dozen times the first week that it came out yeah no it's the same thing um and it it's uh, it's a it's a cool one for me. Makes me feel old. But uh, watching uh, A40, he was uh, he was my first freestyle lesson when he was uh, 13 years old up at Stevens Pass. I, I was his coach for a couple of years, and I I remember uh, introducing him into like what a nose butter was, and then to watch him in this movie, I'm just like, holy cow, dude! Like, who would have ever thought, man, that like. <laughs> You know, yeah. like teaching you a nose butter, but now like you're just doing the most insane stuff. But that's been uh, kind of a cool one to watch as, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going on 37 now and watching people I've coached or influenced with skiing and where they're at. Um, you know, I, I guess to kind of ramble off some names, which is kind of funny to watch now, especially with what's going on in the women's skiing. But uh, I, I remember like one day just uh, spending a day with, uh, is it Kelly Salardo? 
and, and teaching her how to do a hippie killer on a box when she was like 12 years old. They're starting to like just crush it in the X Games, at least the last couple of years. And then Eileen Gu, she was a she was on our North Star freestyle team. And I, I remember kind of coaching her on the side a little bit. And then now seeing her like winning every single thing that's ever came out and possibly going to the Olympics. I was just like, holy cow, time flies. <laughs> you know, yeah. but definitely. And I think may, may, this might be a good time to get back in the timeline. So after, you know, after your teenage years, where did you go? Um kind of personally and professionally before the show, you said that you had a little bit of break from skiing and then you came back full force. Yeah. So all the way up in, uh, was pretty committed with skiing was on a really good track with it all the way until I was about, I think 17 years old. And then, uh, at least for me in those teenage years, I got into some, uh, Hey, I was just a teenage rebellion, you know, just got, just got into all types of just bad stuff. And then that bad stuff um, took me away from skiing. I lost interest in it and uh, lost interest in a lot, actually a lot of stuff. It was just kind of a dark part of my life. And then it was right around, I think when I was 19 years old, right around that same time, the first X games came out. I, uh, I got back into skiing again and it, it, it kind of just saved my life. Uh, it, it kept me occupied. It gave me the, the, the healthy adrenaline rush that I needed. And, uh, then I just hopped into it full on, um, you know, at that point. And then I moved from Colorado when I was 19 out to Olympia, Washington. And at that point living in Olympia, I think I was uh, the closest mountain, at least at that time was about like four and a half hours away. And, uh, and I was working at an auto body shop and I, I remember it, I tell my parents, I was like, you know what? I, I, I can't just like work in an auto body shop and like live in this town where there's no skiing. And that is where everything kind of changed into more full-time skiing for me. And I remember packing up everything and I moved up to Stevens Pass and became a, a ski instructor. And as long as I was full-time, they gave me employee housing right across the street from the resort. And then, um, that was it, man. That, that, that is what started, uh, like my full drive back into skiing again. And, uh, was actually becoming a ski instructor at a mountain, <laughs> living in employee housing, doing life, like the movie out cold ski every day, party at night. And, uh, that's where I just would build jumps in my backyard and wait for a pow day. Cause we didn't have a foam pit or woodward at that point. And that's where I started learning backflips and misty flips in, into pow and, and started taking them into the park. And yeah, then, you know, from that age of like probably 21 all the way up to 24, uh, went pretty hard on skis. I uh, was doing competitions. Uh, I, that was back in the day when Dan would go off jumps <laughs> and do like, you know, six tens off rails. Like, you know, that, that was when I thought I was invincible. And uh, I was for quite a few years. And then I, uh, after some ski injuries and some, some knee stuff, I, that, that's when I started getting into the butter game. <laughs> yeah. And so did you ever have aspirations of um, like being at the top of the competition scene? Like what was your comp career, if you will, like for you, for you and your whole journey? My comp career was always second place. And at the local mountains, it was actually better to get second place, especially if you work there, because second place always got you free skis and first place always got you a season's pass. Yeah. So second place is always the best. Uh, you know, I um, wasn't ever like super competitive. Uh, you know, I kind of just went out there and did it because I enjoyed doing it. Um, I think I had a couple years where I was like, oh, you know, I, I want to maybe like podium, maybe get it was all about trying to get sponsored. I remember at that time, uh, it, it never happened, <laughs> but yeah, the, the thing with competitions, I did it so I could kind of push myself a little bit, but you know, like getting second or third place and just kind of these small mountain comps was, was about as far as my com competition life went. And then, uh, I, but I think that was a blessing, um, because it forced me into, uh, start looking at skiing a different way. And, you know, kind of like, as we're talking about like transitioning with uh, skiing or even just with myself, that's when I started looking at skiing a little bit different as being like, all right, 
in competitions, you're, you're always trying to do these types of tricks to be able to, to place, uh, you know, in a certain position on a podium, but it just wasn't like how I like to ski. And that's when, um, I started looking into it was crazy, like ski ballet. I, I don't know. You can probably see the poster behind me, but it, it's the movie hot dog. And that, that was like my biggest inspiration was watching that movie and seeing the ballet scene in there. And that's when I first saw the Daffy Butter. And it, so it had been around, but it just hadn't been modernized. And that's where I was like, oh man, what if we can change up the game a little bit? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, man. And so when you're doing your, uh, your lessons, so are you doing just beginners? Are you teaching people how to ride park? And, and who's kind of coming through this mountain? Um, you know, like I, in the last so many years with coaching, it's been a little bit more with, uh, I guess you could say, somewhat advanced athletes. Uh, but I've taught everything from uh, a, a two-year-old's first time on skis all the way up to like, you know, people in their 70s trying to, you know, kind of correct their parallel turn a little bit. So that's been a, a good thing is that I, I've kind of taught a little bit of everything. Uh, lately it is, uh, if I have done any coaching, like even yesterday with a couple of kids in the park, they, they just wanted to figure out how to do butters. <laughs> and that's like my, that's, that's my specialty. And, um, I, that, that's, that's kind of what I just, I love to teach now is, uh, flat ground creativity. I, I find that it's something that can just get created into like such great levels at low risk. And it's, um, it's relatable to anybody on skis versus when you start getting into double corks and triple corks and some of this crazy rail stuff, which that's all great, but only a few can do it. And, you know, even the, the ones that do want to get into it, you, you might get a couple of those good tricks there, man, but the few you mess up, it, they're season enders. You, you mess up a butter, uh, don't get me wrong, you can still get beat up, but you got a little bit better odds. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen kids, you know, as, as, time's, as time has gone on, um, have there been tricks other than the butter that have been in style that, that they've been, oh, I need to learn this, I need to learn this? Uh, I guess like maybe before 2009, I, I remember the truck driver <laughs> grab when I uh, kind of uh, Dumont and a couple other people like were starting to throw that grab. Uh, yeah, we were all trying to figure out the truck driver and uh, I could teach it and, and I could kind of do it and the rest of us could, but as far as being a bunch of guys in the ski industry, we all lack yoga. And so none of us were flexible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That was always the problem with that grab. It's like none of us did yoga. So our, our flexibility was just horrible. <laughs> yeah. But no, like the truck driver, I, I just remember that being kind of a, a pivotal grab at that point. And then it morphed uh, into the octo grab. And I remember the first time I saw that was uh, Charles Garnier doing it in um, Ski Matic, uh, another great ski film that changed the game quite a bit. And I just remember once that octo grab came out where you're doing a little bit of a lead mute with a, a blunt grab. It, it was just a different combo of doing a double grab. And I remember, yeah, uh, pushing kids to try to learn that left and right. Cause I'd always tell them, I was like, it's a great one to do because if you miss one of the grabs, you always at least get one grab out of it. <laughs> yeah. So if you get both and you get a double, but if you miss one of them, ah, you still get a sick grab. And uh, is your clients, especially the kids trying to learn park, are these kids that are just wanting to have fun with their friends or are some of these kids coming to you trying to prep for a competition? So they, they used to come to me to prep for competitions. That was probably back in like 2012. So about like 10 years ago, it was like more of the competition athletes. Uh, I think the people that approach me more now are, are kids that are like, I, I don't do competitions. Um, I, you know, but I want to have fun skiing. And they're like, and the way you ski, they're like, you're having fun doing it, but you're coming out with some crazy stuff that like even some of the bigger name athletes like are like, how the heck are you doing that? And there's like, that looks like a fun way to, you know, still keep skiing, impress people and, you know, uh, 
you know, still stay in the game, even though I'm not going to be a, a competitor. So I say it's just more of just people that like to ride kind of on more of the mellow side. Yeah. Plus people like over 35 now hit me up a lot because <laughs> they're like, all right, they're like, I have a kid, I have a job and like my health insurance doesn't cover this. So they're like, what can I do on skis? That's fun. And, and not get broken off. It's like, oh man, there's a ton of stuff you can do. <laughs> yeah. That's sick. And so where do you think all the, uh, where did all the comp kids go? Cause there's still, there's still people competing in competitions, but I guess they're not coming to, uh, like the local instructor on the mountain as much to, to get some park tips. No. And, and that's the thing, like, uh, the comp kids that I did coach, gosh, maybe only a handful of them are still even in the game, still doing it. Um, it just seems pretty short lived. Uh, like they, they hit a, a point, you know, like, uh, maybe in their late teens or early twenties where they're, they're at their pivotal point and they did get in a couple and then injuries just always broke them off. And, or it was just the fact that it, it became a job and it didn't become, it wasn't a, a love anymore. You know, like they went out there and they were treating it as a job, which is, you know, for some people, man, you got to make a living off the sport but it, it killed the passion of, of why they actually love to ski. And I noticed a couple of them that were great skiers and did do a lot of comps, but they weren't able to get into X games or, you know, get first in due to where they, they got frustrated and burned out and they, they ended up getting different passions, you know, outside of skiing, which is totally cool. Like maybe they picked up surfing or they got into working on cars <laughs> But I, I saw the competitions scene um, actually uh, take out the, the love of skiing for quite a few people because mm -hmm. of just uh, what the vibe of it is. You know, for some people it's cool, but for a lot of people I saw where it, it took away really why, why we love to ski and it, it turned it into a job. Yeah. And so, so what's the main mountain that you're riding at right now? Yeah, right now it's Mission Ridge. It's been Stevens Pass uh, off and on for the last 10 years, but now it's good old Mission Ridge. It's, a, it's like a family run ski resort, uh, two seater ch chairs at the bottom, super old school. Uh, half of the clientele up there, man, they're wearing jeans and car hearts and they're like farmer people and I'm, I'm down with it. <laughs> yeah. There, there's no tech Patagucci gear up there and I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. So it's, it's been kind of nice to head back to a good small mountain fam. Yeah. So what caused the transition? Were you getting sick of Stevens pass or was it other factors? I, I'll keep it real here. I was, I was sick of Vail. Okay. Stevens pass was a great mountain, but once Vail Mart bought it, you know, like, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest about Vail, dude. Uh, one of the best analogies for Vail, uh, I think, is Vail is to skiing what Monsanto is to agriculture. If wow. you like supersized fake stuff, man, then, then you'd be cool with Vail. But I, I've just seen them change mountains as far as uh, their actual character and vibe. And, you know, that's one thing I saw with Stevens. It's a great mountain. But when they uh, Vail took it over, man, it really changed the, the vibe uh, up there. It, it, it took it away from the locals and it, it, it catered now to this one percenters that really don't. Yeah. It's, it, it's just like escalates and fur coats and just snobby people, man. And that's where a lot of us, I know when it comes to veils, like it, it, it's cool, man, putting your new chairlifts, we're stoked on that, but you just can't rip the heart out of, you know, what the mountain was. It's yeah. like the movie out cold, <laughs> like we were talking about earlier. <laughs> yeah. So like the, the, the chairlifts are obviously a positive, but what are they changing specifically? That's kind of changing the vibe at these mountains. It's kind of like a, yeah. uh, no, it's like from what I've seen with Vail is, uh, yeah, they got the money and they uh, definitely put in like, you know, some new good upgrades with everything, but um, you know, from what I remember just kind of hearing, even the foundation of how Vail started was, you know, it was, it was, it's like military style. I think it was started by four guys uh, from Vietnam and that's, it still runs that same structure today where it's just very corporate, corporate military style. And you'll see it like, even with their suits on the hill, hill. I used to always crack up, uh, seeing that the different suit colors, like, 
oh, at ski school, they all look like a bunch of Smurfs. They're all in blue suits. And then you got like, if you're a director, you, you got a red suit. And then if you're like a, you know, like a general manager, the gray suit. And so like, even the fact that they chose these different suit colors to kind of like show who you were and what level you were on the hill. I was like, man, that's just kind of jacked up. Like you don't need to do that. But the way I, I see it with Vale is um, it's about money. It's not about the sport. And just the way of how they price out things. Uh, I've seen to where even at, you know, like in villages that have uh, different um, restaurants that are owned by families where Vale wants to buy them out and the family's like, no, we're not selling. So Vale just jacks up like what their rent is so that it forces them out. It, man, I feel like they're like the damn cartel of skiing. They, they, they're ruthless and you know, that it, it's just, uh, it, it's the best example, man, is the movie Out Cold. Like they, they, they called it right there, you know, like, what was it, Bull Mountain or whatever. And then like that guy comes out from Colorado and uh, just changes up the whole scene. Like that movie is like, I, I swear to God, it was based off of Vail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, so are you ever getting on the icon program or are you staying well away from that? Um. You know, I, I've heard great things about the icon. Um, I think that's a, a good one out there. Uh, but, you know, the Epic Pass, especially this year, uh, talking to a lot of different people, not a good year to get the Epic Pass. You just couldn't go anywhere with uh, with how the whole COVID thing went. Because I, I would always try to get the Epic Pass just so I could go up to Whistler. But there's no way you're getting across the Canadian border right now. So there, yeah. <laughs> it. Yeah, it's uh... – it's definitely interesting. You know, I, I, I wasn't, um, you know, I was too young to kind of appreciate how, how things were before, but it's definitely nice getting to hear, you know, how things are really changing kind of rapidly too throughout the entire industry. Yeah. Like a, I guess a good example of Vail, I thought it was funny. The first time I was ever introduced to like whatever Vail is, was actually at Vail Mountain when I lived in Colorado. And I think I was about 13 and me and my parents went and skied at Vail. And the biggest turnoff, I just remember they just, it felt like a Disney world. Like they had like cars out there on the snow. It's where I was just like, something isn't right about this. Like, why are we having all this advertisement for like Cadillac and Jeep and like cars on the snow? And, you know, instead of it just being like people up there to ski, they had like all this different tubing setups. And I was like, man, you guys like turned this thing into like an amusement park when it should just be a ski mountain. And he heaven forbid you chose the wrong ski run and you ended up on the wrong side of the mountain. You had to spend the whole day trying to figure out how to get back to your car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so you've been doing the, the coaching thing for quite a while now. Has, has skiing taken you any kind of side routes while you've been on this, uh, on this journey? Um, yeah. You know, like it, honestly, probably in the last four years, I haven't really done a whole lot of coaching. Um, you know, like I, when I see kids up in the park, you know, like I, I do like some like little tips for them and stuff, but that, nothing as far as uh, getting paid to coach anymore. It's just kind of a, a side hobby of like where I, I kind of just share some knowledge to, you know, because somebody shared knowledge with me at some point and just kind of pass along to sport. But uh, yeah, not doing a whole lot of coaching uh, anymore. Uh, now it's just, uh, yeah, with Ski Creative, it's 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 just trying to find crazy new stuff that you can do on skis that you just don't see too often. Yeah, and I think th I think this would be a good time. Let's get into the weeds on on what Ski Creative is right now because you're really popular amongst the younger generation. Like Ski Creative is basically perfect for the Instagram generation of skiers. It's uh. Yeah, so I guess going back to the roots of how it all started, um, in 2016, I, I hit a tree skiing going like 35 miles an hour, uh, almost died, and I got I got put out for the season after that. And um, I, I just remember I was super bummed because I, I couldn't really go out and film. I couldn't ski uh, at all that season. And I was just like, and Instagram was kind of just something I maybe dived into like a couple of years before that. And I was like, you know what, like nobody's really created a page to put um, just just all the creative stuff that's been done on skis onto one page. And 
that's where I was like, you know what, I'm going to start a page and dig through the old files and new schoolers and, and pull out footage of, you know, just some of the crazy creative stuff I've seen and like get it out there and then like kind of build a platform that like kids, you know, that had that one unique, unique thing they could do, uh, could have it, you know, broadcast to the world. And I, I'm not going to lie, man, those first couple of years were, were tough. It was like walking on eggshells, uh, posting people's stuff. Uh, you wouldn't believe uh, some of the messages I got from well-known people being like, why the hell are you like posting my stuff? You don't have permission. Like who the hell are you, dude? And then <laughs> I'd have to explain to them being like, oh, you know, I, I'm not some guy that works for Amazon or like some crazy marketing company. I'm, I'm just some guy that's wanting to promote like what you're doing on skis. And um, it's kind of taken off from there. And that's one thing I've noticed with ski creative is, um, whenever somebody checks in on the page, they, they know what they're going to see is going to be something different. Maybe they they've never seen before. And it's, it, yeah. And it's just a, it's a platform. Cause I think everybody has that like one unique creative thing they can do on skis that nobody else can. And, and it, it, it builds a platform that, you know, that you can get out there to the world, you know, like maybe they can't do a double cork, but man, maybe they can do a goalie slide down a box on their skis and, just like man how the heck do you do that <laughs> yeah and so what was the point where it transitioned from you know you're digging through the internet and you're curating these videos to people are reaching out to you saying hey i want you to share this video of me that's only kind of happened in the last two years man it wow. used to be, i i would be digging for the footage or just scrolling through instagram trying to find these clips and it it's kind of nice now, especially with the busy schedule. A, a lot of stuff just gets sent to me now, being like, "Hey, can you can you get this out there so people can see it?" And I'm like, "Sweet man, that like saves me time from not having to try to dig this up." So it's it. I feel like at this point, I uh, got a good good partnership with uh, a lot of the industry and the athletes. Uh, they they know the guy that's promoting their stuff. Uh, it's been around for a bit, and. Uh, you know, I, I practice what I preach, you know, like uh, ski creative, man. That, that, that's the only way I ski. <laughs> yeah. Keep skiing weird. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, a lot of a lot of guys, you know, especially the younger skiers, they want to do something. They want to do something to make money or just do something with their time. And so how do you monetize a platform like Instagram or at least get, in, you know, something tangible out of it, at least like free gear? Like what was your process of getting – Cause I know that you have um, like you work with Talty on at least collaboration. So, so what was that like? Um, so that, that's been a, a, a great partnership with Paul that runs Talty's. I've known Paul uh, probably for the last, gosh, I think seven years. And um, I, I remember like telling Paul, I was like, Hey man, I want to use your Talty's leaf symbol as like the eye and ski creative this way. When I start this page, I have like a company that has roots and, and they know I'm legit. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, that's where I partnered up with, with Paul, uh, with Tall Tees and, um, you know, the, got the game going with Ski Creative. And, you know, like I was just actually just talking with Paul the other day. We were just like, holy cow, we never would have thought it would have gotten this big. And so now it works out great for companies uh, like Tall Tees, uh, you know, that we're able to kind of help each other out. You know, like if he wants to kind of get the name of Tall Tees out there with a giveaway, you know, like I got the platform to kind of do it and get kids hyped on it. Um, another good company, uh, Wear Leathers, uh, run by my buddy Marshall down there in Utah. Um, he hit me up about three years ago being like, hey, I'm starting this glove company. Are, would you be down to hop on board? And I was like, yeah, let's let's do it. And now, now we got this. The, my own ski creative mitten, <laughs> you know, to come out and, and he's producing some great gloves. And so from what I've seen now with uh, companies that I'm coming in contact with, it's, uh, it's helping newer companies kind of, you know, get off the ground and, and get known out there with a, a good product and having a platform to reach the audiences. And um, yeah, there's, but there's, <laughs> I, I know like some people are like, man, do you make money off any of this? I don't make a dime. Uh, but I, I never wanted to uh, ski creative. Like I, I've told many people, it's not 
something that I ever wanted to make money on. It, it, it's something I wanted to be there to just help keep the sport going and keep athletes hyped. Uh, I, I feel like some of these platforms, the minute you start making money off it, uh, you're using other people's talent for your own, uh, you know, <laughs> financial situation. And, it, and the industry will sense that in a heartbeat. I yeah. see it constantly when you start seeing people doing giveaways like on a ski account for like men's underwear or something. You're just like, nah, oh, man, something's not right here. Like it still has to be core and it has to be with skiing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And so if you were going to like to give some advice to um, somebody starting up a page like that, because, you know, there's some others that are kind of similar. What would you tell them to help grow their platform or what are some strategies that you've used to help just grow and spread, spread your message? Um, like I, I know a couple people have asked me that question. I was like, you got to find a niche with your page and kind of stick with it, you know, kind of figure out, be like, okay, do I want my page to just specialize in butters? Okay. Well name your page, however you want. If it's only about rails, you know, like maybe do a, a great account that my buddy runs uh, called rail scheme and, you know, stick with just rails because this way it's something unique and then you got to stick with it. Um, and, and not stray from that. Uh, the next is, uh, gosh, it's, it's a struggle some days, but upload constantly. <laughs> content, content, content. Um, and then the next one is, uh, I always feel like the whole industry and skiers in themselves, they, they can sense if you're real or fake. Um, so you got to be kind of true to like really what the sport is and what you promote and that you're doing it for the sport and not yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. and that, and that's, that's been the biggest deal with uh, Ski Creative, man. It, it's all to keep the sport alive and keep it going forward. It has uh, nothing to do with me and like creating a name for myself. You know, I, it, of course it kind of happens along the, the road, but man, it, it's all about the community and keeping skiing alive. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And do you ever have any uh, like uh uh, frequent flyers, if you will, on the uh, ski creative page. Are there are there guys who are you just like, damn, I'm I'm sharing another video of this kid. Like, is there anybody like that? Yeah, yeah, no. I <laughs> uh, uh, B Mac uh, Maximilian uh, from the bunch. He's probably one that I share quite a bit. Uh, my next buddy. It's been in the last year. Um, he goes by the name Till I Break till I break it. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, Pierre. And, and this guy has just been coming out with some crazy stuff. Uh, yeah. And it's like one of those deals though. I'm just like, man, I, I can't post another video of you. I just did one like the other day, but he keeps dropping just crazy stuff every day. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, I say Pierre and BMAC, uh, you know, two of my favorites. I, I definitely like to, you know, get posts out there on, um, Gosh, there's just, there's just so many good skiers out there that are doing crazy stuff. It's hard to keep up with them. <laughs> yeah. And do you have any help running the account at all? No. And it, it, that's one thing a lot of people think is that there's multiple people running this account. It, it's just me. Yeah. <laughs> and so like, <laughs> if any of you guys are listening and I, and I don't respond or to your video or message right away, because it's, it's a one man show. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that is incredible that it's just you because even scrolling through the the story on that account, you get, you always, you know, do a nice tag for all the, uh, all the uh, athletes. It's just, that is just so much content to be pumping out for something that you're not even getting paid for. No, I, I know. And that's the, that's the deal though. It's just, it's the, the love for the sport. And then I, uh, I think getting feedback from people uh, when I meet them or they even message me and just like, dude, that, that page is like changed how I looked at skiing. Uh, it's actually got me fired up about skiing again, thinking that there's only one way that you can ski, but now I know there's like a, a hundred different ways you can ski. Uh, that that's kind of the biggest payout is just seeing people stoked on what the page has done. And I, and I think that's what gives me drive. <laughs> Keep running it. Cause there's some days, man, I, <laughs> I'm just like, I got to get off this phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, how much time, like, would you say that you're committing to this on maybe like a daily or weekly basis? Uh, if it was like, 
uh, daily, uh, if I'm not busy skiing, looking at least like three hours a day. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think this week has been the only weeks I've been on skis a bunch that maybe it's just an hour a day, <laughs> but yeah, it's usually about three hours a day. I'm, I'm, I'm wrapped up with, uh, social media and it's all right. There's some days where it, it got to try to find a little bit of a balance with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And have you ever gone like, uh, cause I've seen some ski creative gear, but have you ever gone for like an official drop where you said, say, Hey, I'm going to print out a bunch of hats and shirts. Cause that would definitely increase your time commitment by quite a bit. You know, I actually did that, uh, like three years ago, I think like kind of the first, uh, after the first year of running the account, it was starting to get kind of big. I was like, you know, let's create ski creative hats and beanies and, I still actually have a ton of hats and beanies uh, still left over from that order. And from what I kind of found out with all that was um, I, I created a brand when it actually it needed to just be a community. And that's what I saw happen is when I started creating hats and beanies, um, it, it was running a very fine line of now starting to make uh, a profit off of that name. And, and skiers providing footage for that site and just something didn't feel right about it. And I think even the industry kind of sensed it being like, yeah, man, like, why are you trying to create, you know, a product now when you have athletes that ride for all these different companies? And so that's where I, I, I kind of stopped that deal and uh, just kept it more a community basis to where we're not really committed into one company, like it's everybody. Um, you know, we work with tall tees, we work with planks, Solomon, K2, line, full tilt. And then this way it keeps the door open for everybody. And it's not like a specific brand or anything like that. But um, gosh, I think that the only thing we came out with lately was just a ski creative mittens with uh, leathers, but we only made like 20 of those things. And it, it was just, a, yeah, just do something kind of fun, but... <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna be sending anything uh, to make hoodies and all that stuff anymore. Yeah, <laughs> stickers are actually a better deal to do. <laughs> yeah, well, it's definitely way cheaper to produce stickers than a bunch of hoodies. Um, so I, I think it's great that you're kind of building a community and rewarding creative skiing. Do you think that, especially on the competition circuit, do you think that creativity is rewarded enough? Um. Yes and no. Uh, I, I think with X Games uh, bringing in the knuckle huck, I think that has definitely helped out a lot with promoting a little bit more creativity of what you can do on skis. So I think in the competition realm, the knuckle huck has been about one, one of the only things lately that I've seen that's been promoting the creativity and it actually gets kind of respect for what those guys are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I kind of watch slope style, totally respect what everybody's doing in there, but it, it also comes off a little bit robotic, at least to me. Um, yeah, knuckle huck though, man, you never know what you're going to see. <laughs> and yeah. so I think that's been a great one. And I, I've seen it even with uh, terrain parks after the, they brought knuckle huck into the X games, like, you know, terrain parks and I are like, oh, we're actually going to spend a little more time on our knuckle here <laughs> versus our jump because more people can uh, hit it, you know, it's just, uh, you know, everybody from, you know, my age that wants to just do a nose butter off it, it to somebody that wants to like, gosh, you know, get into like a, a, a court five or seven off that knuckle, you, you can please everybody with a knuckle. Yeah. <laughs> the jump. <laughs> For sure. And so uh, we're getting close to an hour here. I think this would be a good time to move into some uh, viewer questions. So Hudson White, asks, uh, how do you make your money? And so we kind of get, went over it. You have a, a day job. Yep. Yep. So that's, that's how I make my money is off, uh, my day job, uh, making sure tourists don't get lost in this Bavarian town I live in. Yeah. So that, that, that's how I make money. Uh, as far as, uh, with the ski industry, I, I, I've had a, a, a little bit of payout with some coaching. Um, but, but that's been it, man. <laughs> yeah. And he also asks, uh, would you consider yourself the butter king? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, I, 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 maybe one of those guys that butters a lot and is known for it, but definitely not the butter king. There's, there's, uh, there's definitely some bigger kings out there that have done it. 
Um, I just think probably with the platform, maybe, maybe I just get a little bit more eyes on my stuff, but not the Butter King. <laughs> yeah. If anything, I, I think uh, it, it, Mr. Topher, uh, I think Topher's the Butter King, you know? And, uh, you know, to, and it kind of, I need to kind of dive into that a little bit. Uh, is uh, Topher, is, I, I took the, because people always ask, like, where the heck did Daffy Butter come from? And I know it's a love hate butter trick by some in the sport, but I, I got it from the movie Hot Dog, watching uh, Harkin. <laughs> that was his name in the movie, do it on the ballet scene. And so I, I kind of modernized it uh, a little bit into like the new school realm. And then I, I believe from what Topher's told me, he saw me doing it and then he just took it to the next level. And so I, I think Topher's the butter king at this point. <laughs> well, I, hope, I definitely hope he hears that. Um, so Maxim asks a question, uh, kind of affects a lot of people, is so have you had any ACL injuries? I've had uh, both knees. Uh, I, not, not anything I needed surgery on, but I've like, you know, shredded up like some ligaments. And I think that's what got me out of the jump game and more into the butter game was uh yeah knee, knee pain from landing backseat off jumps so yeah. yeah and and so it's definitely it's something a lot of like kids run into so what would be your advice for someone who's kind of sidelined by a knee injury like what what should they do to just overcome it and stay stay involved or at least like something that they don't want to you know just roll over and die basically well you know there's uh that's what I was saying. There's a lot of just cool ground tricks you can do on skis that um, are pretty chill on the knees. Uh, I know a big one for me with uh, when the knees were kind of weak for a couple of years, I, I just started filming and editing, doing photos, uh, finding a different outlook with skiing so I could stay connected, be on snow with my friends. But, you know, instead of me going off the jump, I was like, I'll be the guy that holds the camera. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, and you know what? And sometimes that was the best payout. Like, cause when they would land their trick, it, it would be as big a stoke for me as it was for them, you know, being able to film it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think this, so this last one, and I think it, it rounds it out nicely. Uh, we'll get you kind of in coaching mode a little bit. So Jarrett Bones asks any special tip, any special tips for learning nose butter slash Daffy's ways to prevent edges from catching. So let's get the official verdict on, on how to do this, the official word. Okay, so it, if he's talking about like nose butters, like a nose butter three. Um, I, the way I've always thought about it, because I was actually telling a kid about this other day, is I think about it like a 180 to 180 instead of it being an actual continuous movement, which you can totally do later on. Uh, so as far as when I do a nose butter three, uh, at least in a progressive uh, mindset, is I'll jump a 180 and once it lands, switch, add pressure on the noses. And then at that point, you can ride on those noses as long as you want. And then, you know, add pressure on the noses again to flex them and then pop it back to forward. And that will keep them from not catching uh, versus it being a full continuous movement. Think of it 180 to 180 and just adding a little bit of flex pop at the 180. Okay. As far as the Daffy butter goes, um, one, you gotta just figure out what ski you want on the tail, which one on the nose. <laughs> and uh, I actually got a, a progression video uh, that I, I made up on YouTube of actually how to do it. I'll, I'll have to shoot you the link if you wanna throw it in the description. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, it's a tough one to explain, uh, the Daffy butter, um, but it's literally like I usually, I like to spin all my stuff to the right. And so I like to come in switch. And when I come in switch, um, I use that coming in switch to create momentum. So once the skis pivot to forward, then I flex my right foot down. So the, the right foot, the nose is in the ski and the left foot is on the tail. And then that's what helps the skis raise up off the snow and then it'll drop right back down into switch. So it's literally like a switch butter three, but then you just have a daffy in between it. Uh huh. And so, so your leading foot, which what, what are you pressing down on your leading foot when you're turning? Is that the tail or is that the nose? So for me, the way I do it, my leading foot is on the tail. 
Mm -hmm. and my back foot is on the nose. Uh, if you're to watch my buddy Topher do, do it, he's the exact opposite. Uh, he usually likes his lead foot being on the nose, which to me just seems terrifying. Yeah. Uh, you know, like it, it's just crazy. Like we, you can do it either way. Uh, just for me, I always just found out my lead foot being on the tail is just, it's a little bit safer, at least for me, but you, you can do it the other way too. <laughs> Definitely. Well, that's all the, that's all the viewer questions I have. Dan, you're a very creative guy. It was great getting to talk to you. Just want to thank you for coming on today. It was, it was great getting to know you. Oh yeah, for sure, man. Thanks for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, definitely.